Hello sweeties. Today we're heading further back in time, um, specifically to the French court in the 17th century. Julie Daubigny was born in Paris. We don't know her exact date of birth, but it was between 1670 and 1673. Her father worked for Comte d'Armenac, or Count Armenac, the master of horses for the king. Her father was responsible for training the court pages and ensured his daughter was trained alongside them. So she learnt to dance, to draw and to fence. Unusual education for a girl in those times, um, but it was an education which would serve her very well over her lifetime and she made excellent use of it. Um, she was apparently already sleeping with her father's boss, but he grew tired of her outrageous behaviour. Um, she liked drinking and fighting. Um, and so he decided in order to get her to calm down, he would marry her off to a clerk, Sio de Maupin, in 1687. Um, she would have been between the ages of 14 and 17 at this point. Um, her new husband was sent to a new position in the south of France. However, the Count kept her in Paris. I wonder why. Around this time, however, she started another affair. This time it was with an assistant fencing master named Serenes. Now, he was wanted um, for murder because he killed a man during an illegal duel. So they fled to Marseille. Now along the way they would give fencing exhibitions and they'd sing in taverns and local fairs in order to earn money. And Julie would wear men's clothing. She never made any attempt to disguise her gender. However, many people would refu refuse to accept that she was a woman, especially men. One night, in fact, one story claims that there was a drunken onlooker who very aggressively starts swearing that that's not a woman, can't be a woman, no woman could be that good with a blade, it has to be a man. Julie's response was to remove her shirt and demonstrate that she was definitely female. Um, when she arrived in Marseille, she joined an opera company and she performed under her maiden name, while well, there, she reportedly grew tired of Serenez um, and moved on to her next romance. Now, the target of her attention this time was the daughter of a wealthy merchant. When, their fam when this woman's family found out, um, her lover was sent to a convent in order to separate the two. So, Julie, in order to rescue her lover, took orders herself, joins the same nunnery, Disinters the recently dead body of another of a, another nun, places this in the bed of her lover, and then as they escape, they set fire to the convent in order to hopefully cover their escape with the chaos that ensued. However, the freedom from that was short-lived. Um, and Julie was arrested on several charges. <laughs> Arson, kidnapping, uh, grave robbing, and assaulting the officers who were sent to recover her lover. She was initially sentenced to death. Um, however, she wasn't, you know, if she was anything, she was creative in her solutions to problems and she did not give up easily. She contacted her old lover, Count Armagnac, you know, her dad's boss, and asked him to speak to the king on her behalf. He did, and the charges were dropped. Now, at this point, she's back in Paris. She goes back to Paris, and she joins the Paris Opera and performed as both a contralto, the lowest female range, and a soprano, which is the highest female range. Um, and there is a big difference between those. So that's impressive. There were several parts written especially for her throughout her career. However, while she was performing, she did continue with her scandalous behaviour. Um, she often challenged people to duels, including dukes and duchesses. Um, she's reported to have killed, or at least injured, over 10 men in her time. And these are the, you know, we, we've record of about 10. It's probably a lot more. She, okay, the following are the most famous that I could find, or the most interesting. So, 
Number one, a male opera singer was badmouthing her and other female performers, so she challenged him to a duel. Um, he refused. I mean, naturally, the woman sounds completely terrifying. So she beat him with a cane and stole his snuff box and watch. Later, she overheard him claiming he'd been attacked by a group of thieves. So she called him a liar and threw his belongings back at him. She often did this with the victims, apparently. She would take souvenirs from them and return it to them in very public manners so that no one could get away with lying that they'd lost a duel to a woman. Um, one night, a very drunk man was hitting on her heavily. After his attempts at flirting became insulting, she got into a fight with him and his friends. Um, she stabbed him in the shoulder. And then she visited him in his sick bed later that night and seduced him. As you do. Last but certainly not least, she attended a masquerade ball dressed as a man. Now, the king was in attendance at this masquerade ball, so it was pretty, pretty high, high event. So there she is dressed as a man and she spends the evening flirting with a young woman. Um, and this offended three of the woman's previous suitors who were obviously vying for her hand in marriage. This, this upstart that nobody knew had just turned up because they thought she was a man. And then later in the evening, Julie decides to kiss the woman in full view of the ballroom. The men are outraged and challenge her to a duel on the spot. Naturally, being Julie, she agrees. And out they go outside. And naturally, being Julie, she wins. Now, as per, according to the law at the time, because the anti-dueling laws were getting very strict at this point, um, she should have been put to death. It should have been the death penalty. However, the king was watching and he found it entertaining. And he decided that the law was for men. This law in particular was for men. It mentioned men, it doesn't mention women, so eh, it doesn't apply to her, it's fine. Um, afterwards, though, she did leave the country. She went to Brussels and waited for things to blow over. She was still being outrageous and, you know, challenging people to duels, etc. But she became involved with the elector of Bavaria. Um, and he eventually grew tired of her flamboyant antics and offered her 40,000 francs to leave him. 40,000 francs to leave him alone. And naturally, she was extremely offended by this. She reportedly threw the money back at his emissary and in some reports actually kicked the emissary down the stairs. When she was with the opera, she, def she fiercely defended the chorus girls um, who were usually lower class women um, just trying to make a living and she defended them from the unwanted advances of excuse me, male performers and you know from the nobles that would come backstage after shows seeking to take advantage of these women. And not much is known about her final years. She did retire from opera in 1705 now, some accounts claim that she joined a nunnery and died there. These are mostly ones from the time when they tried to turn her life into a moral tale. And of course, you can't have a good moral tale without the wicked woman repenting at the end. Um, and similar are the accounts that say she returned to her husband and lived those last few years quietly with him. However, some also claim that she found her last one true love with um, Madame, de, Madame Le Marquis de Florenzac, um, oft, who was often referred to as the most beautiful woman in the world and was also one of the king's mistresses. So, pretty important. However, these stories also include that she died of a broken heart when her love passed away from a fever only a few years later. We do know, however, she died roughly around 1707, but like with her birth, we have no exact details. There's not even a record of her grave. However, 
this date would put her in her 30s, meaning though her life was quite short, especially by today's standards, it definitely wasn't boring. Thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next week. Mwah.